Finally, we've made it! Three years into the Twilight Tober Zone, and at long last I get to talk to you about my absolute favorite episode of this entire show, The Obsolete Man. This is a piece of classic vintage TV that is still as relevant today as it ever was. The themes and morals aren't unique, but the execution of this story in every facet, from the visuals to the performances to the writing, are top of the heap for me. It's brilliant from the bottom up. Let's talk about why. Romney Wordsworth functions as a librarian in a totalitarian nation known only as the State. He's called by his government to be judged and is found to be obsolete by the presiding chancellor and the other drones who inhabit the courtroom. There are no books or libraries left in the State, thus no use for Wordsworth. When the chancellor declares Romney useless and compares him to a minister in the society because he says the State has proven that there is no God, Wordsworth argues the opposite. No man is obsolete. Regardless, Romney is sentenced to liquidation within 48 hours. Through the rules of the state, he's allowed to choose the method of his execution and when within the 48-hour period it will occur. He decides, and is allowed, to tell an assassin the way he'd like to die, while keeping the details to himself and his state-appointed executioner only. Another appeal he has is that his death be televised for all of the state to see. His pleas are granted, and the following evening, Wordsworth waits in his room for the end. As a last request, 45 minutes before his death at midnight, Romney asks to see the Chancellor, so the judge visits the condemned man in his room. The Chancellor expects Wordsworth to beg for his life, but instead, he informs the overconfident officer of a hidden bomb as his choice of death, and soon he reveals the Chancellor has been locked inside with the librarian. One of the customs of these liquidations is to isolate the obsolete citizen before their death, so no one is around to release the Chancellor. With the whole nation watching, Wordsworth taunts that the state won't be embarrassed by sending someone to retrieve their high-ranking official, and begins reading a copy of the state-banned Bible. It becomes a game of dignity in death. Who will crack under the pressure and beg for his life? Wordsworth and his rebellious spirit, or the Chancellor and his staunch government ideology? I love everything about this episode. There are so many things to say, even outside of my admiration for it. The Obsolete Man is an important part of the series since it was the finale of Season 2. This was the last time we saw this particular introduction, and Rod appeared on screen at the end of the show for one of the rare times. Although, in his opening and closing narrator shots, he doesn't seem to be on set like he usually was during this era. They tried to fit in the camera movement that always revealed him in the opening, but it comes off a little clunky here. For the closing, they wipe slash dissolve back to the narrator as he delivered the last few lines. Story settings that involved dystopian, oppressive futures were nothing new in 1961. George Orwell's 1984 and Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451 may have influenced Serling here. Wordsworth being a librarian and direct mentions of books being destroyed and outlawed definitely sounds like it derived part of that concept from Bradbury's story. Did this upset Bradbury? Maybe. When we get to the episode I Sing the Body Electric next year, I'll finally dive into Ray and Rod's rocky relationship. On the flip side, you can make a simple argument that Serling was just building off the infamous book burning in World War II era Germany. He often called back to that time period, and since he was a veteran of that war, it's no wonder why. The back and forth debates from Wordsworth and the Chancellor are all incredible. They're essentially debating the worth and definition of humanity and individuality, freedom of expression and religion, pursuit of knowledge and critical thinking, the effect of a tyrannical government's rule over its citizens, and more. You have no function, Mr. Wordsworth. You're an anachronism, like a ghost from another time. I am a human being. You're a librarian. I exist. And if I speak one thought aloud, that thought lives, even after I'm shoveled into my grave. Delusions, the narcotics that you call literature, the Bible, poetry, essays of all kind, all of it, an opiate to make you think you have a strength when you have no strength at all. This is the Twilight Zone at its best, as it's all accomplished in a very digestible manner, making the situation just exaggerated enough to not have it feel like we're being beat over the head with the messaging. While those morals aren't subtle in The Obsolete Man, they're implemented in an entertaining and compelling way, leaving the viewers' minds more open to absorb the material. In addition to the knowledge that books can bring to the masses, religion becomes a central theme. Since the state has proven that there is no God, there is a God. The state has proven that there is no God. 
You cannot erase God with an edict. Later in his room, Wordsworth reads from the Bible as the clock ticks down to his demise. This has a double meaning in my interpretation. Since it's been banned for over 20 years and a crime punishable by death, he's throwing its words in the Chancellor's face. It's an act of defiance. But he's also trying to get the state official to crack under the weight of their impending deaths. Many people would turn to some kind of faith in that situation, some kind of hope against hope that we'd survive the scenario. That's part of what makes us human. Romney is showing the Chancellor that he's not some higher power unto himself, and the state is not a replacement for God or the natural order of the universe or however you want to define it. What's really clever about Wordsworth's plan is that the whole nation is seeing the ideology of the state crumble under humanity itself. Let the whole country see the strength of the state, the resilience of the state, the courage of the state. Let the whole country see the way a valiant man of steel faces his death. The Bible verses we hear Romney read from in the montage are all from the Book of Psalms, and they weren't chosen extemporaneously. He starts with Psalms 23, a well-known passage. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. This establishes the confidence Wordsworth exudes as a man of faith. He's truly not afraid of death in this moment because, among other reasons, with his last act, he believes he's making a righteous stand against his oppressors and exposing them to be the same as the people they hold down. As he mentioned earlier, Death is a great equalizer. The second passage read is from Psalms 59. Defend me from them that rise up against me. Deliver me from the workers of iniquity and save me from the bloody men. This is about asking God to protect the innocent who are under attack and punish those who do unprovoked harm, a clear parallel to what the Chancellor and the state have done to the population of this nation. Next is Psalms 14. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. The Chancellor's denial of God's existence and the consequences of that denial are hammered home by Wordsworth here. Finally, Psalms 130 finishes the show's readings. Lord, hear my voice. Let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. Not a lot of it is read, but there is a bit of hope here. Crying out to God, asking for forgiveness, waiting for redemption. Considering what follows, it's appropriate. And I think that all leads to what Wordsworth is attempting to get out of this set of circumstances. Dignity in death, and how that's delineated in this scene. Romney is resigned to his fate and accepts it with grace. The Chancellor? Well, we'll get to that in a few minutes. I can't understate how amazing the performances were in this episode. Burgess Meredith gives one of the best of his whole career and speaks Serling sometimes wordy prose with an effortless elegance, inimitable poise, and cunning charm. He knocks out a towering grand slam as Wordsworth. You cannot destroy truth by burning pages. It's also funny how Meredith continued his association with books in the Twilight Zone, considering he played bookworm Henry Bemis in season one's classic, time enough at last. Brilliantly playing off Burgess was Fritz Weaver as the Chancellor. This character was a total 180 from the heroic William Sturka in another season one classic, Third from the Sun. Being his only two Twilight Zone appearances, these installments really showed off his range, portraying a believable protagonist and antagonist in different stories. Delusions, Mr. Wordsworth, that you inject into your veins with printer's ink. You have nothing but spindly limbs and a dream, and the state has no use for your kind. You can see he's drawing from some real-life dictators when he's orating behind his podium. The defiance of Wordsworth begins to get under his skin in that scene, but it's not until he trades barbs with Romney later that we see a more personal side. You've got a worthless, miserable little life, but you've also got an instinct for survival. You're not facing the camera, Mr. Wordsworth. You're cheating your audience. They want to see how you die. Face the camera. That's right. And don't stifle your emotions. If you feel like crying, go ahead and cry. Or if you want to plead, plead by all means. Some high state official might take pity on you. It's a multi-layered characterization that gets better as the story proceeds. He was able to show off a wide range of emotions and excelled at all those sequences. Weaver was just the perfect foil to Meredith's lead. In a smaller role, Joseph Ellick does a nice job as the subaltern. He represents the cold rule of the state with his thousand-yard stare and emotionless delivery. Romney Wordsworth, step back to await the finding of this board. His voice was supposedly based on Senator Joseph McCarthy. 
Elliot Silverstein made his Twilight Zone directorial debut with The Obsolete Man. He had a background in theater that translated well in this episode, with that opening scene in the courtroom as the prime example. Everything is huge, and it looks like a stage play set. Just a massive room with harsh shadows, 25-foot tall doors, a single long table, and a giant podium for the Chancellor to stand behind. It's probably my favorite set from the whole show. According to an interview with Silverstein, those doors were the tallest ever built for a TV show at that point. You can see the influence of German Expressionism here. It's not as stylized as something like the Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, but one could draw the comparison. The creative visuals continue in Wordsworth's room, where we get a great-looking montage of time ticking down to the bomb exploding. It's perfectly paced out and creatively edited. Speaking of editing, Silverstein had a big problem with this episode's editor, Jason Burney. We'll talk about that after the twist. After an agonizing 30 minutes and no one coming to save him, the Chancellor pleads with Wordsworth to be let out of the room. Please, please, if let me out you. in the name of God, let me out! Let me out! Let me out! Let me out! Yes, Chancellor, in the name of God, I will let you out. Wordsworth gives the Chancellor the key to escape with a few seconds to spare. From the stairs below, the official sees the room explode, killing Romney inside. Sometime later, the Chancellor enters the courtroom and discovers that he has been removed from office and declared obsolete for being a coward and disgracing the state. You are obsolete. 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 You are obsolete. When he attempts to run, the people nearby turn into a mob and violently swarm him. He's consumed and torn apart, ending this story on a terrifying note. Silverstein had the people who surrounded the Chancellor start a slowly rising wail that increased in intensity until Weaver's character began running. I want to serve the state. Please! He conceived of this guttural, disturbing noise through a dream he had had. It was very important to him to have the full sequence in the show, but Silverstein and Jason Burney disagreed heavily on the cut of the final scene, to the point where Burney refused to edit it the way the director wanted. Producer Buck Houghton, trying to please both parties, made a compromise, but the resulting cut still wasn't what the director wanted, so he decided he was going to do something about it. Silverstein got together with other Twilight Zone directors like Buzz Kulik and Lamont Johnson and shared his experience, which the other directors had also gone through a similar version of. Together, they put new rules in play with the union, where editors couldn't do something like that again. They'd instead be fired on the spot, giving the directors more power and say over the final cut of their projects. While I believe the Silverstein idea of that scene would have included more of the wailing, I don't think what we got lessens how creepy it turned out. It is an uncomfortable final sequence that sees the Chancellor begging for his life. His faith in the state has failed him, and the mob that encircles the former official feels like a visceral nightmare. Weaver again kills it with his confidence switching to pleading, an impeccable and versatile acting job that created one of the most memorable antagonists in the series. A couple of other quick notes that I found interesting. As always, Rod advertises another episode at the end of the broadcast, but since this was the season 2 finale, they talked up the series premiere, Where Is Everybody? It aired the following week as a rerun. I just thought it was a cool tidbit that the first episode of the show does have a traditional preview out there. Also, Serling peddles more cigarettes, which is always fascinating to me. It's often said that a picture is worth a thousand words, case in point. Before we meet again, try Oasis. You'll know what I mean. For my money, The Obsolete Man is the finest The Twilight Zone ever got. As I said earlier, the messages and morals aren't as subtle or even as fun as other installments, but the phenomenal filmmaking, writing, and acting put this one in a class all its own. If you ask me to recommend one episode of this series, it's always going to be this one before any other. Needless to say, I recommend it in the strongest of terms. This story is anything but obsolete. Any state, any entity, any ideology that fails to recognize the worth, the dignity, the rights of man, that state is obsolete. A case to be filed under M for Mankind in the Twilight Zone.
You are obsolete.